Hello and welcome to the Everything Is Black and White podcast. I'm Andrew Musgrove, joined by John Gibson. It is the international break, but there's still plenty to talk about when it comes to Newcastle United. And this week, myself and John are going to focus on the big topic, the topic everybody is talking about, and that is the future of St. James's Park. Should Newcastle United stay or should they go? It is a topic which is emotional. It is splitting the fan base. And let's be honest, there's probably not a right answer. Newcastle United are not going to be able to please everybody when they finally come to their verdict on the future of St. James's Park. We're going to talk through where this feasibility study is, is at at the moment. We're going to talk about some possible relocation sites for Newcastle United and, of course, whether we should stay or we should go. John, welcome back to the podcast. We'll get your verdict as the show goes on. Um, I just want to start by asking you to tell our viewers, to tell our listeners, what St. James's Park means to you. Uh, I mean, because of age and because a fan is so many Newcastle fans are from cradle to grave, it it means everything in that it's held all my dreams, it's held the completion of my dreams, my frustrations, and I go back so far. I mean, as a little lad, I remember going to St. James's Park in the 50s and watching, you know, just the sides just after the three uh, FA Cup wins in the 50s, standing with Uncle Frank behind the goal at the Lees' end um, when literally, because you were standing, not sitting, literally you got moved 100 yards just by the crowd swaying, lifted off your feet and, and moved with the crowd. Um, it was such an emotive place. Uh, I then went through all its transitions, both as a fan and <clears throat> as a reporter. I mean, I remember on the popular side, all the uh, telegraph poles going up right along the popular side with the floodlights being put on the top of them. Um, that they were just on the top of huge uh, telegraph poles and the lights would go out and you would say in the middle of a match you would get a couple of bulbs would go out in the floodlights and there would be shadows cast across the pitch and all and it somehow in the in the ridiculousness of it all it led to the to the fascination in the emotive and the the drama of seeing these shadows and the, these wonderful players i progressed i mean I progressed to up the rickety stairs to go up to the press box on the roof of a wooden stand. I mean, you know, if there was a fire, you, you were Guy Fawkes. And in, it, at that stage, the ground looked like a huge aircraft hangar. It was in this awful sleek grey, um, looked absolutely dull. But what there always was running through the whole of St. James's Park was a unique atmosphere. Now that's created partially by the um, the ground, but mainly by the fans inside the ground. And Newcastle had that, and then it came all the way up. I was part of the Magpie Group that was uh, attempting to take over Newcastle United with Sir John Hall. And when that reached fruition, John, of course, built the current St. James's Park with uh, the 52,000 capacity, which at the time of it being built was quite wonderful and quite something and is now quite dated because that's what progress is called about. And it's ironic, isn't it, how football is developed, Andrew, because we are talking about the need for Newcastle United to have a new ground, not just because of all the facilities and the uh, the match day facilities for food and et cetera, et cetera, which increases their revenue, but because we need a bigger ground than we've got now, 52,000, because of Newcastle Gates in the future, if they become as good as everyone, including the owners, expect them to be, then 52,000 is is limited. And we need more people in St. James's. Ironic, isn't it, that the actual record attendance at St. James's Park was set way back in 1930. 
I mean, you know, we want more people in now. The record attendance, 68,386, was, was set on September the 3rd, 1930. Now, we all know why that was, because you could get more in because people were standing in the main and you can push them together like sardines. But it was quite incredible. It was set as long ago as that, and we've never got anywhere near matching it because the stadium's not big enough. We could, we could top that attendance now if the stadium was big enough, which is why we want to increase it. But that, just to dwell on that for five seconds, that was back for Huey Gallagher, the, the first number nine idol we had of the St. James's Park crowd had been transferred because he was a wild boy and a naughty boy and too much for Newcastle to handle. Been transferred to Chelsea. Chelsea were coming back to play at St. James's Park very soon after his transfer. And he was loved so much, up to 20,000 people were locked out of the ground. So we could have got 80, 88,000 in there had there been room. And it was played, Andrew, on a Wednesday afternoon because there wasn't floodlights on that day, on a Wednesday afternoon when everybody was at work. Not on a Saturday afternoon, but on a Wednesday afternoon, not a Wednesday night, when everybody was at work and we got 68,000 in. And, you know, we want to get more than that into a new stadium, which is why we're about it. But, you know, my heart will always be uh, with St. James's Park because it's been our home for 130 years. But at the same time, it, it's everything so emotive because it's it's romance against reality, isn't it? The romance is something you can never take out of our hearts and our love. Because, but the reality is, we need to create more money to compete with people like Arsenal and Spurs who have moved into bigger grounds, and, and to do that. We've got to do something about St. James's Park. It may be the cathedral on the hill. It, its positioning might be absolutely perfect where it dominates the, the skyline. But we, that's been so for the last 130 years. We've got to think of the next 130 years. You know, this this is goes on beyond my lifetime, beyond your lifetime. It goes on theoretically forever. And we, we've got to... Think of future generations and not just past generations. That's why it's so emotive. But naturally, my heartstrings are totally and utterly. My whole memories of Newcastle United that were so dear to me are tied up in St. James's Park. Yep, some lovely words there, some lovely memories of John's uh, time supporting Newcastle United down the years. And I guess, though, John, some would say that what you're talking about is the past that the nice memories, but also as you've just alluded to there, we have to start thinking about the future and it's an uncomfortable subject when we talk about the potential of leaving St. James's Park, but it is a subject we have to talk about if Newcastle United are going to bring in that revenue to really match those already at the top of the Premier League. Um, and I, I do think sometimes that gets lost when people are talking or looking at it from an emotive side. They don't really maybe see the bigger picture, the, the the fact that revenue is so important. And we'll get onto that in a moment. But what I want to do um, next is just kind of present to the audience where we are at currently with the current feasibility study that has been undertaken by Newcastle United. We were told that it was imminent. And we are now told that it'll be early January or early 2025 when they do, um, you know, announce something. Brad Miller spoke to uh, the Fan Advisory Board earlier this month, and uh, it has now entered a crucial second phase, uh, the board were told, with a more detailed analysis currently taking place to investigate project-related risks and opportunity before a decision stage in early 2025. So it looks like in the new year we will get a bit more of a hopefully a, a conclusion, a firm um, end to this feasibility study. And as I said in the introduction, it's not going to be a verdict that is going to please everyone. I do not envy the person having to make this decision. Now, in a statement that was released last week by Newcastle United, there was a long statement by Brad Miller. And I'm just going to read some of the key points, John, and then I'll get your take mm. on it. 
Um, he called it an extremely complex project. He said, we aren't quite at a decision-making stage yet. We know what a transform St. James's Park would give us, but it also is clear that this option has several risks associated with it. It must provide an investable return. Part of the process is also to understand an alternative option so that we see the bigger picture. This is a once-in-a-generation investment, so we don't want to look back in years to come as a club or city and regret an opportunity missed. So I've taken snippets from his full statement. You can go on the Newcastle United website and read the full uh, statement from Brad Miller. But what stands out there for you, John, from the bits that I've, 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 I've given you there? Yeah, I mean, in a way, my stance over the whole thing is very much like Eddie Howe's stance as it happens, which is my natural instinct <clears throat> is to want to stay on the same site because that is Newcastle United's home, it is the cathedral on the hill, etc. But I can be swayed because I don't wish to live in the past, however much the past might be dear to my heart because it holds so many wonderful memories of Newcastle United. People that live in the past die in the past. It, you know, the world goes on. You've got to keep moving forward you've got to be one step ahead and therefore despite my age despite my memories etc etc i'm all for what is best for the club and for the future de generation of newcastle united fans because if we are going to compete with people like arsenal and spurs who have taken huge steps forward regarding their stadiums then we have got to make the best. And this is almost a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You can't keep rebuilding the ground or keep moving the ground. You get really one massive shot at it, and this is going to be the massive shot. Um, and therefore, that's why it's taken so much time. Because the, there's got to be so much money poured into it. Luckily, we've got owners that are capable of doing that. But in return for that, that it's got to be something that's per permanent and fit for fit for purpose, and um, therefore that takes time. And I'm happy to give them that time. And um, my first reaction, by the way, this off tells you, doesn't it? I would think how the Saudis are committed to Newcastle United, because you wouldn't take on something like this and spend the money they're about to make if you were going to pack up in a even a decade and a half like Ashley because somebody else gets then gets the benefit of everything you've done like Manchester City etc etc I think they see this as a project that's not only long term but it is is theirs and they are going to remain at Newcastle United um I mean I'm open to be swayed by the arguments of the people that that put the finances together but the one thing that I'm very uh, determined in my mind that I want to see is Newcastle United either stay exactly where they are and we will get into what they can do if uh, what's limited they can do if they do that or move exceptionally close to where they are the idea of moving to any sites that are up by the airport or anywhere else would not be for me because that has taken newcastle out of the heart of the city out of the heart of their domain and moving them to a brand new situation and almost starting as a new club if they're going to remain where they are whether that is ripping down uh, the whole ground as we see it now and we and putting or erecting a new stadium or whether it's moving just outside in the Leases Park um, area that I can live with and be happy with because it's called progress. I am not keen if they're going to go out of town and away from where they are now. Yeah, I think from what I've been told and people you speak to, one thing that is certain that whatever the verdict is, it will be a city centre-based staging because they understand the importance, not just of the passion and the connection 
and kind of the advantage it gives to Newcastle United, you know, when you've got that city centre feeling, but also the importance to the local economy. And Brad Miller mentions there, you don't want to look back as a city and regret the decision made. I think what we have to compliment the club for doing, and look, we would all like to know where we stand in terms of St James's Park right now, but this is not a decision that can be rushed. It's not a decision that can just be made half-heartedly. And if it takes an extra few months to what we would have liked, then fair enough, long as they've you know done the work and they come to the table, whatever the verdict is, and they come to the table with everything spelt out, I can, you know, I can live for the next year, a few months of not knowing because it is such a big decision, as Brad Miller has said there. You know, it, it's yeah. and the, I mean the really interesting thing is, John, I saw a tweet over the weekend which said, "I'm not bothered about Newcastle growing their revenue." And another tweet that said, "I'm not bothered about cups if the souls ripped out of the stadium." And I was thinking, what are you talking about? I come on this podcast and, and you do the same, John. And if I see something on social media, I always that, that I don't agree with, I always caveat by saying, You're entitled to your opinion. You know, my opinion does not matter more than the person who's tweeted that. Sure. But I will say, I have to, I do think that that tweet about the revenue and about the cups is so baffling because at the end of the day, you know, if I'm on my deathbed, I'm not celebrating the fact Newcastle United stayed at St. James's Park. You know what I mean? I would like to be thinking I've seen them lift a the cup. Um, you know, the growing the revenue is so important. And the people who complain about losing St. James's Park and, and, and what goes with it for the, the growth of the revenue will be the first to complain about not signing big players, about not being able to keep your big players, about not seeing the squad progress. But the reason that won't happen is because there's not enough revenue. And, you know, it was mentioned in the statement by Brad Miller about whatever they decide has to allow them to grow when it comes to PSR. And, and you know, it's a horrible word, horrible word in many situations, you know, in many ways, business, you know, because we like to think about Newcastle United being in here, in our hearts, you know, we like to think about being emotive. But at the end of the day, John, the owners now have ambitions. You know, they're going to put money in, but they want to see a return on their investment. And I always felt it would come to this point where at some point in the project, it would make people feel a little bit uncomfortable, you know, whether it's to do with corporate, whether it's to do with massive sponsors, whether it's to do with a new stadium. But at the end of the day, you've got to do all this stuff to grow your revenue, to grow the team. And it's, it, it, it's what comes when you have ambitious owners. Yeah, it, it, it's romance free reality. Uh, that is the thing that every fan is facing at the moment, the romance of what St James's Park means to us, to our fathers, to our grandfathers, to everybody from the year dot 130 years ago, against the reality of how do we exploit the situation and keep pace with Arsenal and Spurs and because that's what we've got to do now. We've got to we've got to blow them out of the water. And if we stay with fifty two thousand at St James's Park, and we won't because it'll either increase or whatever. But if we do that, then we're not going to compete. But one of the reasons as well, Andrew, why it's it will take an awful long time. Not only have Newcastle United to decide what is best for the club and what is best to earn the revenue to allow the team to become Premier League winners and eventually Champions League winners, which is what was talked about by Amanda when we first come in. That doesn't happen just through romance. That happens through hard-headed business. But it is also not just in Newcastle United's hands, Andrew. For example, if... I, I have personally seen uh, one of the projects that was put very early days before Newcastle United. It was quite revolutionary. It was for Newcastle to stay at St. James's Park, but for the capacity of St. James's Park to be increased. Now, that involved relocating uh, Grade 1 and Grade 2 listed buildings at Lees's Terrace in St. James's Street West. Now, it it actually meant because the the list without going into too much detail which can be boring the grade one listed part 
is just the front, the facade of the buildings outside of St. James's Park, not the buildings themselves. Now, it involved rebuilding the buildings themselves further back, at, but keeping the, the front facade, the, the grade one listed, and building that onto the new building. Um, and that is possible to be done as far as the grade one and grade two uh, uh, people are. But to do that, for example, you've got to get the agreement of the local authority. You've got to get the agreement of the Friends of Leases Terrace and Leases Park. You've got to get the government department, which includes listed buildings, to agree to it. And you've got to get the current owners to agree to it. Now, supposing we, this is to stay at St. James's Park in some shape or form. Now, supposing you want to develop St. James's Park to the ultimate, then what you do is completely reconstruct the stadium. You don't add little bits on the top to give you another 10,000 seats or 5,000 seats. You virtually pull the stadium down in stages and rebuild it so it's a whole new stadium when it's completed, but on exactly the same site. Now, the cost of that can be up to a, a billion pounds it's phenomenal but apart from that newcastle united can't decide they're just going to do that even because they've got deep pockets because there's only 70 years left on the lease now that might be a lifetime to you and i but it's not a lifetime to a football club and 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 the council have have the lease so they've got to get the agreement of the council to either increase the lease or waive the lease or let they can't go ahead and do it themselves they've got to talk to the council to 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 move back these grade one and grade two listed buildings just outside St james's park which has got them hemmed in which is why they can only do a certain amount of things you've got the local authority the friends of, of leases terrace the government departments and current owners nothing newcastle united if they move the ground they've got to talk to the people that have got the ground they want to buy it's a they it is not a decision purely for the club to make once they decide which one of those they like they've got to enter into the before they tell us that is it it's no good telling us right we're going to stay at st james's park bulldoze the stadium and make a new one and then the council say oh no you're not you've only got 70 at least you know and you've got to stick by it they've got to talk they've got to decide which they want and then talk to the appropriate authorities it is a heck if a transition and it's not just up to Newcastle United what happens mm. well as Brad Miller said in that statement is it is an extremely complex project and there are so many people that need to be absolutely uh, talked to uh, about whatever Newcastle United do and the fact that you've listed half a dozen there shows you just how many uh, people will need to be consulted and then you've got also the reaction of the fans as well and we have got a list of uh, potential locations that Newcastle United could move to on the idea that you put forward because we will actually start about with the idea of extending St James's Park I was very against um the the anything happening to those listed buildings and I get what you're saying there's a there's a proposal or an idea that they could be moved back a little bit um for me just touching those buildings I would not be would not be for that because I think they're part of Newcastle's New, part of Newcastle's culture. They've got as much right to be there as a stadium. I think the money it would cost to do that would be worthwhile. And as again, Brad Miller referenced in his statement, it needs to bring a returnable investment. In terms of could they extend the Gallagher end? I mean, that again would be a massive uh, job. You've also got the issue of the road um, behind it. Like, when you look at it, it's such a great stadium, but the location it's in makes any potential extension just so difficult to do because you've got issues of access. You've got issues, like we said, of the list of buildings. How do you get all the workmen to the ground to, to, to do the work? Where do Newcastle United play while all that goes on? You know, there's so many elements that need to be considered that would make this timely and costly. But I guess, John, the main one that really stands out is the fact that Euro 
2028. It's not that far away. Newcastle is meant to be a host city um, for that competition. Would it be possible for Newcastle United, for instance, if they were going to stop at St. James's Park to extend one of the stands in time? Or it was the other extreme to knock the whole thing down and rebuild within, you know, four years? Uh, it, 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 it's, it's a big project. It is a big project, and I don't think it ought to be determined by the 2028 Euros. I mean, uh, this is the future of Newcastle United for the next 130 years, haven't had 130 years. And the heck with worrying about, yes, we want that, it's, it's prestige, it's finance, but this is bigger than that to us. I mean, we, we didn't get, because St. James's Park was so so poor, we didn't get the 1966 World Cup. Middlesbrough did and Sunderland did for the group stages and Newcastle was considered not good enough. But, you know, life still went on after that. I take your point in a wonderful world, et cetera, et cetera. But when we make decisions, and by the way, every decision is hard. I mean, you know, it, there's not an easy decision once you decide to do the ground. There's no such thing as an easy decision. Every decision is hard and every decision is costly. And every decision is going to have its difficulties, whether that is bringing in the workmen or... The greatest difficulty, which which John Hall had, and it would be much greater when he was turning St. James's Park into what it is now from what it was when he took over in the 90s, the greatest uh, problem was you've got a living stadium. You say, where would Newcastle play? In the main, they would play where they are. You would knock down one bit and try to rebuild that bit. Then you know what the old stadium is going to be like, but you wouldn't demolish it and, and, and bulldoze it into the ground and then start from north and build it because Newcastle United have nowhere to play. Anymore. You would knock down part of it, shut one end of it, and that end would be built while you had a three-ended ground and then you would go on to the next bit and the next bit. It's, it's going to be like playing in a, on a building site for a while. There's no other way around it if you stay on the site it's on, even if you end up with a magnificent stadium of 80,000, which is effectively a completely new stadium. But the old one will have been knocked down in stages and the new one will have been built in stages. They still continue to play there. And 2028 must not come into Newcastle United's thinking. So you would you support if needed them pulling out of that obligation and saying sorry, you know the bigger picture is getting a, a St James's Park up the scratch for the, if, the next hundred and thirty odd years. Yeah, if they were going to stay where they are, you know, you make a few quid out of that and you get a bit of prestige out of that. But I mean, look now, are we suffering because we didn't have the nineteen sixty six World Cup? I don't think so. No, I don't true. think. We I don't think we've suffered at all from having that. In fact, I think most people now can't remember that we didn't have it, unless you're an old decrepit bugger like me. Uh, there was a round then and, and had to go to Middlesbrough and had to go to Sunderland to see the World Cup in the, in the North East. And believe you me, Andrew, that was a big talking point at the time. And that was the end of the world. That Newcastle didn't have the World Cup, except it wasn't the end of the world. And we've got to look at this situation, not with blinkers on, as we've talked about, but with blinkers off. Not just talking about romance, but talking about what is best for the club in terms of do we really want to become a Champions League side? Do we really? And I'm not talking like when we dipped our toe into it the season before last, I'm talking about permanently. Do we really want to win the Premier League? Do we really want to win the Champions League? Then we've got to have a stadium worthy of it because it produces the finances. That doesn't mean that we've got to move away from where we are or move too far away from where we are. But it does mean that we've got to bite the bullet on some things. Now, whether that's the Euros, whether it's playing on a building site for two years, three years, uh, or not, you know, because Everton played Goodison and the new grounds built and then Goodison's, that's different. But if you're going to stay on the site you're on, even if 
the stadium is going to be unrecognizable because you're not going to patch things on the top of it. You're going to actually reconstruct it, but on exactly the same site. Then we're going to have to put up with things in the meantime. Mm. Yeah, there's no, no easy decision, and there's no nice one. And cosmetically, it, it's not easy. Believe, and and it is not just Newcastle United's decision. And that's the most worrying of the lot, because yeah. you've got to get agreement and goodwill from other people that's going to be involved. Yeah, most certainly. So I think, I mean, obviously, we're no experts in the building trade, and maybe someone who is watching yeah, this yeah. could let us know. But it's had quite a few extensions hasn't it already St James's Park and you, you do wonder how many foundations are already there in terms of the stands which have been redeveloped over time and how difficult that might make a further uh, you know development can, in, in the future Andrew, because I've seen this original project that went up to Newcastle United which has probably outlived its time now but it is possible with a slight movement of, of, of situations to build on top of what you've got and extend it upwards in only a little way outwards because you're restricted outwards. But, you know, um, we're 52,000. The next question is, what size stadium do you want? I mean, we can easily, not easily, nothing's easy, but it can be done to make it a 62,000 seater stadium where you are by patching things on with great difficulty. But there's clever people around and the Saudis will employ clever people. Where John Hall was off a good mark with the limited work he did, but it wasn't limited at the time and it, it, it produced a wonderful reaction, was that he was actually in that business of building it he built the metro center his company come and all developments he owned the club suddenly and had the perfect tools to do what was needed at st james's park because his company built the metro center for goodness sake so that's what they did having had their own feasibility study about moving away or building on at st james's but he took it to the next level but now is a problem. Is it worth spending an awful lot of money to increase it to 60,000 or 65,000 just building on to what you've got? Or do you say we stay where we are, but we theoretically demolish it completely and build a brand new stadium and perhaps get it up to 80,000? Hmm. Well, that is the key question. What is the ideal capacity of St. James's Park and would it be cost effective? to extend St James's Park and only take it up to 60, 62, 65 when you compare how much it might cost to build a new stadium elsewhere. Now, they're all the, the, the sums and the maths that the, um, the owners will be doing because at the end of the day, it is about making a profit and it is about getting a return on your investment. And if it's going to cost you, I'm just putting a number out of the air, but if it's going to cost you 700 million for an extra 10 to 15,000 seats or it's going to cost you one and a half billion for a brand new 70,000 seat stadium. If it was me with that money, I know which I would pick and I would go for the new stadium because it's cost effective or it's more cost effective in terms of what you can maybe earn off new corporate areas or, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it's a, it's a multi-purpose stadium. You could have other events there where now it's in James Park. It's not quite right for that. Um, I tell you one thing though, John, you mentioned it at the start there. You said, oh, you know, this shows you that the Saudis, are definitely committed. It, it is definitely going to be a test of that because when this report drops on their desk and someone goes, it's going to cost you one and a half billion pounds to move, it's going to cost you 800 million pounds to stay and get to 65,000 or it's going to cost you a billion pounds to knock it down and rebuild it. It's going to take this long. You know, they are then going to have to make a decision and, and you know, we will know exactly how committed they are by the decision they make. That's true, but it's also true to say to reach this stage, they've got to be committed because you can't start saying we are going to do this with St. James's Park and that with St. James's Park and end up doing nothing because all the figures are too big. Nothing is too big for them as long as they are prepared to stay for the duration. They can afford it. This is the one thing the Saudis can do for Newcastle United AFC that's not restricted by financial fair play. They can't go and blow the transfer market into the middle of next week because you're not allowed to do that. But you are allowed to develop your, your ground if you've got enough money and they have enough money. 
But to do this, you're not going to do this and whatever they do. If even if you built ten thousand onto St James's Park on the top, you know that would cost. So you're up to sixty, sixty-five thousand. That would still cost an awful lot of dough by our standards. And they're not going to do that to suddenly sell the club in ten years' time, are you? Because it might be a good thing for Newcastle United, but it's not a good thing for the owners to have shelled out all that money and get no return because they've sold on in ten years' time. I mean, they are going to remain as serious players at St James's Park once they do something. And now they've pushed the boat out and said they wish to do it, as opposed to just getting on with and, and concentrating or trying to concentrate publicly on the team and all that and not mention St James's. Once you start trying to do something with St James's Park, you can't renege and say we're well, reneging because it's going to cost too much. You've, you've already pushed the boat out. So I can't see how they can look to be leaving St. James's Park in a short space of time. Mm. Yeah, and it's really interesting if you look at what they're doing over in Saudi Arabia. They are going for the 2034 World Cup bid and they've, they've promised to build several new stadiums. I mean, some of the work art, John, it's just, it's like something out of another world. Um, in terms of what these stadiums look like. Um, I'm not too sure if uh, St. James's Park ended up looking like several of these photographs I'm currently looking at. Um, it would go down too well. But there are some nice um, stadiums proposed. So, that, you know, and I think this is the one thing you can guarantee, you know, with Newcastle's majority owners. I mean, also, don't forget the Rubens, you know, they are in real estate and they, you know, they're building buildings in the city. So they know what, what they're doing, how to make their money go as well. If they have to move, or even if they stay, it will be the very best stadium possible because that's what they're good at. They've got the funds to do it, and they're going to have the right people to do it. I guess it's just a case of how much better it might be if you're not restricted by the location St. James Park is currently. And if you're going to go to another site, if it's Lisa's Park, if it's Castle Leaders, Lisa's Taumua, you know, you've got an open space to build with and it would be a lot easier to build a multi-purpose stadium, the best the world has maybe ever seen or certainly the best the Premier League has ever seen when you haven't got the restrictions of access maybe as you might have currently at St. James's Park. Well, there's a blank canvas. These people that are building stadiums for to get World Cups, etc. back home, effectively have a blank canvas, don't they? You know, they, they're they starting from scratch. This isn't a blank canvas. Certainly, if you stay at St. James's Park, the location they are. And it's not a blank cam canvas if you go next door, using the word next door in quotes. And also, I mean, you know, if you're part of the Saudis in Saudi and, and, and you're part of the royal family, the rule Saudi and everything, you, you virtually do what you like in terms of building. And you, know? you don't have to go cap in hand to, to the local council and say, can we do it? Or to the, the Friends of Lisa's Park or to uh, Grade One government uh, departments. Et this is a different ball game. This is not just up to you. This has got to be up to somebody else. Now, there's no question, I think, that Newcastle Council, and I'm not trying to preempt anything, and neither can we, because it, it, it's not as easy as that. And it's political, and they've got to get the best for the city, not just the football club. But Newcastle Council, of course, recognise how effective and how important Newcastle United are within their sphere, if you like, and how much it they have an impact and a bias with the ordinary public because of all the fans Newcastle and I they've got. But nonetheless, they have a certain situation to do, whether you talk about the town moor, whether you talk about St. James's Park, because ironically, the St. James's Park isn't owned by Newcastle United. It's owned, it, it, there's only 70 years left on the lease. Now, you know, if you're, if you're now a kid, it's going to run out by in your lifetime. So, you know, 70 years from me, forget it. I sure won't be around. You mightn't be, but there's going to be people around there, Andrew. And and you, you wouldn't demolish St. James's Park effectively and completely rebuild a, a new stadium on there with a 70-year lease, would you? 
No, and that's definitely going to be in their way of thinking as well. And that'll come into the, the cost effective effectiveness of it. And the, you know, people you speak to, the council are you know, very willing to make this work because, of course, why wouldn't they be? But I've seen a lot of people saying, you know, you could move into Lisa's Park and then give that give a section of the current site to, to Lisa's Park to compensate for losing a bit of area. But then we have to remember, as you've pointed out, John, that would be up to the council. It's their yeah. land. You can't deny yeah. it. You know, effectively... You can't like, it, can't yeah. say, give us that bit of ground there and we'll build a stadium and you can have our bit to, to move your stuff up because our bit is not owned by Newcastle United. Exactly. Uh, I mean, they own, of course, they own the, the land at the south of it, Strawberry uh, Place and all that, but they don't own the land the stadium is built on, which is most certainly going to complicate things, you would think, when it comes to making a decision. Let's look then, John, at some options away from St James's Park. As I said, my understanding is that whatever the verdict, if it is move away, it will still be within the city centre because you've got the transport links, the local economy. You know, there's no point having it way out over uh, maybe near the race course or near the airport. It just would not work. Um, the first area we will look at is Castle Leasers, which was Sir John Hall's pick for a new stadium, 55,000 seater stadium at the cost of 65 million, which shows you how the world has moved on slightly, John. A 55,000 seater stadium at a cost of 65 million pounds. Just to put that into uh, context, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, which has a capacity of 62,850, took three years to build at a grand total of 1.2 billion pounds. So that puts you puts it well in the context of just how much uh, things have changed financially. But yeah, Castle Leasers. Now, what's interesting about this, this is a separate bit of land to Leasers Park. It's effectively kind of the bit behind it. But it does house Newcastle University's largest uni accommodation there. Now, back in February, Newcastle University promised a £250 million refurb of the halls. Um, now, that, as far as I'm aware, is still the plan. It's still going on. But talking hypothetically, you know, could Newcastle United go to them and say, can we buy this site off you? They could then talk to the council about the actual grassy bit of it. And there you have a, a, a beautiful footprint to build a brand new spanking stadium on just five minutes walk from its current site. Well, I love the idea that it's five minutes walk from its current site. And no question about that. That's why we would, if we were going to move, most fans, the compromise that would probably suit everyone would be that you go to Leases Park or, or Castle Leases because you're virtually uh, at St James's Park still. And you could even continue to call it St James's Park. You needn't give it a new name, although that would be the next thing. Do you then give it a new name because the sponsors buy that name, like the Emirates at uh, Arsenal, etc., etc. But that's for another day. But whatever you do, you need the goodwill of people. You know, you can't just bulldoze the situation and say, this is Newcastle United, this is what we want to do, you know, so we move you all out and uh, and get on and do it. Um, you know, it's not like, I don't know, Kiel there, where, you, you know, you can, you can get rid of villages and swamp them and put water down there. You can't do that here as easily as that. You've got to get the agreement of so many people. And yes, there will be goodwill for Newcastle United. But in certain cases, there won't be any at all. Not everybody's a fanatical football fan like you and I and uh, everybody else. And they might say, no, listen, we aren't interested in football. We want to stay and have this uh, stu uh, this accommodation for students. So we want Leases Park to be Leases Park. And as you say, we haven't got the situation of being able to say, well, we'll, we'll give you our bit of land for your bit of land. Um, so that's where the that's where the difficulty comes in, and that's where you you may well say, right, do we stay where we are, but completely demolish it? Don't stick bits on top of the current stadium, but completely demolish it and rebuild it, state of the art, but on St James's Park site where the access is basically the same access as there is now. Uh, or lack of it, um, and and you build here, and then the only agreement that is obviously leaping out the woodwork to be made is over the lease. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think, like you say, it would be a lot easier if Newcastle United actually owned the land and they could offer it up as some oh, deal. That would, game, yeah, it would game. as it is, it would go down to the goodwill of the council. Now, the other option, I mean, just briefly, just just round off. Yeah. Obviously, Sir John wanted Castle as it didn't go through. You know, the the artwork we've all seen, it would have been um, very spectacular. The other. One just next door is Leeser's Park, 43 acres in size, opened in December 1873. It is owned by the City Council. It's managed by Urban Green Newcastle. It is Grade 2 listed. Now, what that means, it's a registered park, protected. Uh, sorry, it's not protected, though, by a separate consent regime. So where planning permission is sought for development, an affected registered park, the local authority will consider the site's special character and give weight to its conservation. So basically, it's not unheard of that these protected parks could be built on, but it is unlikely. Um, the National Planning Policy Framework defines registered parks and gardens as designated heritage assets, meaning that substantial harm to or total loss of a registered park or garden, or garden should be exceptional or wholly exceptional, depending on the site's grades. We often use the word list in a shorthand for other forms of designation. What is interesting, though, about Lisa's Park, John, is that friends of Lisa's Park have said it is damaged beyond repair, that it's been left to rack and ruin. And in July 2024, it lost its green flag status, which is a bit like you know, time out of having a flag for water yeah. quality and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it just meant it's well managed and it's lovely and tidy. But it lost it back in July. And if Lisa's Park, friends of Lisa's Park are coming out and saying, oh, it's, it's, it's a right mess, does that potentially open an avenue for, for, for Newcastle United to go and talk to the Freeman, which we know they've done? We know they've had conversations uh, with the, the Freeman of Newcastle. Talk to the council and go, well, look, you haven't, there is not, there doesn't appear to be the budget to upkeep this wonderful Victorian park. Let us come in, build a new stadium. You then have the land at St. James's Park. What to say you can't give half of that back to Lisa's Park? And look, what's really interesting when you, I used to work in news and I used to cover planning. And when new um, houses estates or in the, the, the first stages, what, what often would happen is, You'd have developers give a little bit extra money to certain projects, whether that be a big playground or sometimes affordable housing. And it would it was done to maybe help, shall we say, push away the objections. Is to, to you know yeah. to make those who are against it feel a little bit better, you know, because you're getting affordable housing or you're getting a big play park. Give and, give and take, yeah. Yeah. Could you cast and do that and say, well, do you know what? Give us the land to build on at Lisa's Park. What we will then do. If you get the land, it's in James's Park to have a park. We will give you, I don't know, let's say £10 million to help start it. And then we will confirm a little bit of funding for the next decade. Just a few million pounds, you know, it's short change to the public investment fund. But if that makes the difference and that removes the objections, Newcastle gets a wonderful new park. St. James's Park becomes this wonderful leafy green area that's well looked after. And we get a brand new spanking stadium. That ten million pounds could make the difference. Oh, I mean that theory is brilliant, and that would be the answer. And uh, there's no doubt whatsoever that these are the sort of talks that's going on behind the scenes right now, and why it is taken to next year. Because what we are eventually given as a fait accompli might not not have been the first choice. But the first choice might have for, for Newcastle United might have met so many obstacles of people that are immovable, and and therefore they've thought, right, we're going to look at Plan B and this. And but you need the goodwill, and as you say, it would take say the friends of Lee's Park, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, there, the council, the Freeman, they, they they would have to agree on all these switches. But, you know, the switch round of where you, you move the park and St. And St. James's Park, Lisa's Park and St. James's Park, and just turn them round would look obvious and would look terrific and would look the answer 
apart from the fact that nothing's as simple as that, but there's no question that Newcastle United will be able to help whatever avenue they go down by goodwill, by saying exactly what you said, we will give £10 million to help the redevelopment of this, we will do that, and perhaps it'll be called something that will reflect Newcastle United's uh, help. Uh, the Rubens will be terrific in this, as you mentioned, as well as the owners, because the owners, 80%, it's their gig. There's no question about that. It's 80%, it's their gig. But the, the Rubens in this city have got history. They know what they're doing and they can be vital to the Saudis who don't know this city. Same rules apply worldwide. But yes, Newcastle are going to have to opt and opt to help in a way that produces a lot of goodwill factor, helps smooth over troubled waters, uh, helps perhaps the inevitability of somebody's going to lose something, whether you're going to lose Lisa's Park or Lisa's Terrace or somewhere else, you're going to lose something, but this is the compensation and all things thought out, it's better than nothing at all. But you're going to get fierce objections. The minute anything's announced, you're going to get people on the high horse. Uh, of course you are. That happens whatever the decision is. The minute you get the decision, you're going to get fans on the aisles. We're staying at St. James's Park. We really need a brand new start with a, a blank sheet of paper somewhere nearby. Or if we go nearby, we've lost 130 years of history. It is, it is very, very, very emotive. But the biggest thing is what's going on behind the scenes. It's not just what Newcastle United want to do. It's what they're allowed to do or what they can persuade other people to let them do. That's what is going to decide this. But from my point of view, the words coming back to what Eddie said, where he said, I could be swayed, but only by a site that is St. James's Park or is close to St. James's Park. And that is my exact feeling, that I adore St. James's Park. It means everything to me i want to stay on that site if at all possible but i will accept in the uh, because of progress in moving away as long as it's a small move not distance wise i'm talking about not a huge move but we've got to do something if we stay at st james's park the way it is now stick a lick of the pain on it open up a couple of more conference rooms and a couple of more banqueting suites, which we've already done, then we're going to get nowhere fast in terms of we're going to be devoured by all these other clubs that are already up there, like Arsenal and Spurs. I mean, we are fighting Spurs now off equal status in terms of results, um, but, you know, they've got a huge advantage over us. Arsenal in Man City were on the coattails, and then there's Liverpool, then there's Villa, then there's Everton. If they survive all this and get a new ground and get new owners, and will they suddenly be wanting to compete with Newcastle United with a new ground, etc.? Because at the end of the day, when all this is done, it's got to be reflected on the pitch, Andrew. It's no good having an 80,000 seater stadium and getting relegated into the championship like we did twice under Ashley. You're not going to fill the 80,000 seater stadium if that happens. You you know, in us all presuming that it's just a matter of do we need 60,000, 70,000, or 80,000, that those figures are for us to be in the Champions League. If we fall short on the pitch, if we are in the bottom half of the Premier League, and I'm not suggesting for one minute we will be, but we've got to make certain we won't because. 80,000 stadium with 40,000, 50,000 people in it. Half looks empty. Yep, it looks very bad, doesn't it? And I think that's been one of the big debates about, you know, for me, I think 65 or 70 would be the right amount. But again, like you say, it depends on, on the success on the pitch. I think I was I was very against moving. I wanted to stay at St. James Park. Um I've got a record, like I say, I was against touching the, the listed buildings. I was against moving into Leeser's Park or the, the Town Moor, which we'll discuss about in a moment. But 
you know, something has changed in my viewpoint. I think a brand new spanking stadium, one of the best the Premier League's ever seen within the city centre, does appeal to me because Newcastle United to be successful on the pitch, they need to grow the revenue. And some people don't like to, to hear it and they'll never admit it in a month of Sundays, but you need more corporate areas. You need more seats for fans from abroad. You need more seats um, to, to, to be able to hold concerts and, 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 and other sporting events, the NL, NFL, uh, NFL. You need... You need a new stadium with a pitch like Tottenham have got where you can literally kind of put it away to be able to do it so it doesn't get impacted. I mean, there was a documentary and you watch the things that this pitch does and how they store it. You know, that won't be easy to do at St. James's Park because it's on a slope and there's loads of things. Whereas if you go to a new site, it's going to be a lot easier to do. So I am kind of heading towards a, a new site, but long as it's in the city centre. Um I said earlier, by the way, Saudi Arabia are going for the World Cup. They, they of course, have got the World Cup, so these stadiums will will um, go ahead. The other two sites, John, I want to mention, the Taumua was one that has been whispered about. A thousand acres, larger than Hyde Park and Hampstead Heath combined, larger than Central Park in New York. So it's a fair size. Freeman and Newcastle can uh, have their cows on the grass and allow them to roam. For me. Look, it's a big, big site, but it's it's different in Leeser's Park. Leeser's Park, the people who run that have said this is not in a good condition. The town moor, it's easy enough to keep that in good nick. You know, you just need a big lawnmower, essentially, you know, and it's a wonderful place to go walking through. It's a wonderful place to go doing park runs. You have the hoppings and other events there. For me... It's a big enough site where you could probably do something and maintain the rest of it, but I don't think it's in as great a need as investment as Leeser's Park is. So that's why I would be leaning towards Leeser's Park rather than the town wall, which I think should just be left as the way it is. I don't know if you've got a, a different viewpoint on that. Yeah, I, I follow that totally. Uh, I mean, yes, in theory, in all this is theory, you can build a stadium in one of the corners taken that stupidly of the town moor and still have a lot of the town moor left you know you, you wouldn't take over the whole town moor to put a stadium in the middle of it and have car parks all the way around i mean you know it would be some car park site as far as you could see the size of the town moor and um, it's not quite the preferable site as the others, because the others are very close, more close, even close at the city centre. I know it's just up from the hay market, so it's not a million miles away. Um, but you've got to get, you've got to get, um, you know, the the right reaction. Um, you can't just suddenly Newcastle United say we'll have the town more either, uh, or I don't know. Alan Shearer or Sting, I think, might say, no, my cows are on there. I'm sorry, you, you can't. Certainly, Jack, Jackie Milburn would have given his permission when he was a freeman in the city. But that's been flipped. But you know what I mean? It, it, everything needs some help somewhere along the line. I would prefer in an ideal world to stay as close to St. James's or be at St. James's, even with a completely new stadium, I'm stressing, Andrew, not, not, not with a little few patches on the top of the current stadium. Um, in the town where I ain't that far away, once we start going to the airport and things like that, you know, we're really losing the soul in the the soul and the city. And that's too much of an ask for me. Hmm. And one of the other sites that's maybe not been talked about as much, but I've heard a, a little whisper here and there, is the current arena site. Now, when everyone talks about that site, you automatically think about the housing site, which is just beyond it, the Brownfield site, which was bought by the government back in February 2024 uh, by Homes England, and they're going to build like 1,100 houses on there. That's a Brownfield site. Um, that's different. That is owned by the government. I'm not talking about that site. I'm actually talking about where the current Newcastle arena is housed, it is privately owned, and this is all hypothetically speaking, you know, but it's privately owned by ASM Global, and uh, not Alan St. Maxman Global, but um, um, ASM Global. Um, and they are set to take over the new arena, 
which is going to be built between the Sage and the Baltic. Now, that has hit a delay. So, like hypothetically, let's say Newcastle United went to this company and said, I want that land. We can build it there. It's in a really nice location. It's still city centre. Okay, it's not up on the hill. But what you have got behind you, John, are the bridges. And that would look beautiful. Brand spanking new stadium. The start of the seven bridges. Okay, it's the Red Youth Bridge. It's not the most ideal and iconic bridge. But still, you know, got the view of the quayside looking down the river. It would be a really nice location. You've got your transport links. You're close enough to the pub, the pubs and the restaurants that it wouldn't affect the local economy right next to the central station, I think it would be an ideal site, but it would depend on the new arena being built, which has hit a delay. It was meant to be ready in the summer of 2023. Um, uh, construction so far, they've, they've, they've done the kind of digging and you know earmarked where everything's going to go, but um, so far there's been no sign of construction there. Uh, it's been hit by rising costs. It Estimated costs haven't spiraled from original 260 million to 350 million. Um, shows you how the costs have gone up. Um, Gated Council told the local democracy reporting service back in when was this story written? Back in June, that they hope to have some sort of update later in the summer. That so far hasn't come. So I guess it's a bit of a bit of a, a, a moot suggestion because it all is dependent on that new site being built on. But for me, if that new arena was built and we're talking about a city centre location, the current Newcastle arena would be absolutely spawned for me. Interesting. I've never thought of that one it is a possible site for St. James's Park. And you've sold it for the weather. Uh, I've got to say that. Um, but there again, you know... Time-wise, yes, so many things have been delayed. You're talking about the new arena and the, the building of it, and it's been delayed and the costs have gone up. That's one of the problems as well, of course. The cost you get today, Newcastle United get for a new arena, by the time it's completed, you can bet your bottom dollars, it's cost twice as much. So, But they've got that sort of leeway. Would So what I'm saying is that if Newcastle United took a site like where the arena is now or any other site that might come available to them the money they get for that site might help to kick start the the building of the new site and newcastle united it doesn't matter that they haven't actually got going because they could run level newcastle will still be starting behind the arena the new arena site because they would just be beginning to think it out. Mm. You, they've got the basics already into the ground, etc., etc. So there wouldn't be a delay if that could be done. It's interesting, and we're going to get loads of that. And all it's going to do, apart from produce wonderful uh, discussions among fans and and excuses for podcasters like me and you to get to whirl another one out that is fascinating and interesting to everybody and us two get smacked on the head because by certain fans, because we're not saying what they particularly think, but isn't that the wonderful thing about football? It's all about opinion. But can you imagine how swamped Newcastle United are um, with all the information, plus all the other information they have about putting out feelers to people that they need to get on site? I mean, a lot of fans, and I can understand it, might be irritated by the delay, but if you just if fans just listen to what we talked about today, you see the complications that we're talking about, and you know the getting the goodwill of the council and getting the freemen and getting these people and those people on site. And in all these discussions, you can't do them quick. You talk to the council. You talk to anybody else. You know you you talk to the electricity thing about about your your bill. See how long it takes to get through all that red tape to, is real time consuming and so it, it it is an almost impossible task but Newcastle United they will have the right people on it and that will be their exclusive work is to 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 sort a passage through all this complication that, that surrounds it and they must get it right because I know it's a glib phrase and it's a phrase journalists will jump on and love saying it's a once in a generation opportunity um but it is it is 
you can't say two years after it's over. Well, I think we slightly got it wrong there, so we'll go the other way. You can say two years afterwards, I slightly got it wrong signing Chris Wood and go out and sign Alexander Isak. But you can't do that with the ground. Once you've committed yourself to the ground, that's it. And if it doesn't quite work or it's not quite big enough or it doesn't look as beautiful or the access is not as easy, then too late. That's the way it is, brother. Yeah, they've got to get it right because it would be an expensive mistake if they didn't, but like you say, so many things to consider, so many things in plain. As I've said, I do not envy the people making that decision. Obviously, sites like the uh, Cote Arena site, we're just speaking hypothetically about a potential site. Um, yeah. And I'm sure you and I are considering absolutely everything. But John, it, we mentioned it briefly, but it's so important that whatever is built it's not just for football because that's not where a lot of the revenue comes from. You know, we had Anthony Joshua fighting at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. You want concerts coming here. You know, there's so much more that this new stadium has to be able to do rather than just host a football match. Without a shadow of doubt, um, you know, pop concerts, which I know we've had at St James's Park, but all, and we've had the Rugby League weekend at St James's Park, but you've got to open it like you had Anthony Josh. You've got to open it to every conceivable because every day nothing's happening at a particular venue that's dead time and you don't want too much dead time. The one thing we don't want, and of course we would never get, is what I experienced when I owned Gateshead, which is Gateshead Football Club playing at the International Stadium where you had a running track around the pitch. Um, those sort of places and you know it, it, are a nightmare because it takes away all the atmosphere it takes away everything because you're far too far away from the action uh, but those days are well gone there wouldn't there wouldn't be as an athletics doesn't bring in enough money now or revenue or crowds to to want to make it a stadium that can house athletics but outside of having that which is awful and fatal and doesn't work for a football club uh, and the course that wouldn't even be contemplated by Newcastle United. Yes, it's got to be used as often as you can because when it stands empty, when it stands unused, that's dead time and, and that's money wasted or opportunity wasted. Yeah, most certainly. So um, I'm just going to ask you, John, for your verdict to wrap up our discussion. Oh, well, I'll, I'll share mine first to give you 30 seconds or so to, to have a little bit of a, a think about what you're going to say. In an ideal world, I would love Newcastle United to stop at St James's Park. I just don't see how it is cost effective or doable to a certain level that it means they can grow their revenue in line with the likes of a Tottenham or other clubs um, up there. Um, if they decide just to extend the stadium, if they knock it down and rebuild, it would be costly, but I would be more in favour of that if it was a state-of-the-art brand new stadium on the same site but how easy that would be to do I'm not too sure you would have obviously still the same planning restrictions and headaches to, to deal with and access and, and 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 what have you and it would be time consuming and very expensive as well I am more leaning towards moving to a new site within the city centre but as you guys have seen in this video we've given you four potential sites one is listed um one has unique accommodation on one has cows on and one is privately owned and might never be up for sale because the new arena might never be built so that shows you actually the headache that Newcastle United are facing when it comes to finding the ideal opportunity to build a new stadium on and actually John before I get your verdict one thing we haven't spoken about I'm just doing it really briefly is of course the own strawberry place where the stack is. The Ruben brothers own the building next to it, the wellbeing bar. They bought it back in December 2023. Plenty of rumours and whispers from people on social media. Could this be linked? It's not a big enough site because, I mean, technically speaking, you could probably, you could buy up the lease from St. James's Park and then maybe move it back a little bit. But again, I don't know how that would look. You'd have to build over the road. So you'd have to probably have a tunnel running through because you've got access to the to the hospital and what have you. But it, it is interesting that they own that land, um, which yeah. is another maybe 
thing to think about. I just don't think it's big enough. You've got the Metro station as well, which is owned by Nexus, which is another complication. You can't knock down the Metro station. So I know people got very excited over the recent days about that, but I don't think that's one to consider um, just simply because the site's not big enough and the, the, the constraints you've got there. Um, but you over there, John, what would you be doing? Oh, it's a terrific question. I'd be I'd be employing people with enough far more now than I on planning permission and far more persuasive than I and talking to all the people that will object to any decision that's made. I mean, and have a, a, a a position of strength to object, like council, like Freeman, like people that already own sites, like uh, like the Friends of Leases Park, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because it is almost impossible. My natural instinct is to stay where we are. But if we did that, I would want us to to build a completely new stadium on where we are not in stages, which would be because the ground would have to stay open and house matches in the meantime, but it stayed open when John Hall was doing everything he did. It stayed open during that period. It wouldn't be easy. You talk about access. It would. And I don't want sort of little bits built on the top of the current stadium, taking it up to 60,000 or something, and it doesn't look great. Uh, I would want it completely done. Of course, it's going to cost a fortune, but anything they do is going to cost a fortune. Of course, it's not going to be easy. Of course, there's going to be objections. Of course, access and availability is going to be horrendous. It doesn't matter what they do. They will face problems. So, those have got to be put to one side. They've got to be overcome. And with the brains of the Rubens and the Saudis between them, they will find a way around it. They've got to persuade people to accept it. I want. I am willing to be swayed as Eddie Howe is. I would prefer in an ideal world to stay where I am with a completely new stadium at St. James's Park. If I can't have that because uh, if the lease or because of the the amount of work in the billion pound plus it'll take to do it. Then I would want to move to one of the leases. Leases Park preferably would be my site. Um, if again we overcome all the obstacles, but this obstacle we have to overcome some obstacles to do absolutely anything. So I say good luck to Newcastle. God bless you. Get get it right because as Jodies. We're critical. I mightn't be around to criticise it when it's wrong, but there'll be plenty more sitting in my place that, that'll get on their hang legs if it's got wrong. But also, you're doing it on our behalf because however great it is for you, it's still our football club. You might own it, but we have it sold. You own it, we have it sold. And so we want the best for our football club. So go out and get the best, the very best you can do for us explain it in great detail, perhaps tell us why some options couldn't be done. And you know what? We'll accept it. And then we'll look back at the team and we'll say, right, you've got to have a team to match that stadium because you won't fill it if it's not. And it'll come back to what it always comes back to in football, Andrew. Whatever you do, it comes back to the team. Arsenal built a stadium they might now win the Premier League, so that's justified. Spurs have built a stadium, but they're still getting called Spursy. Their fans are still irritated. It's still nothing happening. They don't win trophies. Got to get it right on the pitch. Give us a stadium, and then it's up to the manager, and we've got to get it right on the pitch. But I tell you what, we need success. We've got used to not having it, but that doesn't mean that I just am happy with that to continue at St. James's Park, the hodgepodge it is, just because it's got my soul. I want to win something, and I want to win something in my lifetime. And that's rapidly running out, so we better get on with it. Yep. Yep. Well, fingers crossed. It's We see a trophy lifted in the not-too-distant future. We wait for an update from the club in early 2025 about the future of St. James Park. I'm sure there will be plenty more stories coming out before then, little bits of updates and snippets of information just to whet the appetite for this official confirmation. Let us know in the comments your thoughts on the future of St. James Park. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I certainly have. John, thank you as always. Do head over to chroniclelive.co.uk for all the latest Newcastle United news. 
And for myself and John, we'll see you guys next week.